Those of us here at Colorado State University are proud to share with you this session of Endoscopy Talks. When you're looking for inspiring veterinary CE experiences, think CSU Vet CE. Nestled up against the Rocky Mountains in our new State of the Future facility, we invite you to experience what we call CE Elevated. We'd love to see you in one of our future on-site, online, or blended courses. Check us out at www.csuvetce.com. Now, please enjoy Endoscopy Talks. So today we're joined by Dr. Amit Singh. Uh, he's a graduate from the Atlantic Veterinary College in Prince Edward Island, Canada. He is currently an associate professor of small animal surgery at the Ontario Veterinary College and University of Guelph. And he's focused much of his career towards the introduction and development of laparoscopic and thoroscopic surgical procedures in small animals. Dr. Singh is the current president of the Veterinary Endoscopy Society. He is also an ACVS founding fellow of small animal minimally invasive surgery. Today, Dr. Singh is going to tell us about adrenalectomies for the treatment of adrenal neoplasia in small animal practice. So without further delay, I will turn the session over to Amit. Thanks so much for that uh, kind, very kind introduction, Dr. Tweed. And, uh, you know, I, I, again, I just wanted to uh, thank you and Dr. Chamnis and Jeff Dodson in, in the in the background, behind the scenes, taking care of uh, all of the IT. Really, thanks so much for setting this all up and, and having me. It's a great honor. Welcome, everybody. Uh, those of you tuning in, uh, you know, probably a variety of different time zones. Uh, really looking forward to have this discussion for the next 60 minutes or so. You know, adrenalectomy is one of my uh, favorite uh, minimally invasive procedures. And so really excited for this webinar. Uh, you know, I, I must, uh, you know, I must say I've had so many mentors along the way, and that's predominantly been through the Veterinary Endoscopy Society. Uh, you know, too many mentors to name that have kind of helped me with not just learning about laparoscopic adrenalectomy, but, you know, so many other procedures would definitely encourage any of you, if you're interested, to, uh, you know, join the society. And, and you know, the, the goal is really just to have discussions like this, um, you know, just for the, for the better of uh, all of us and trying to get, uh, you know, even more efficient at our minimally invasive procedures. So why don't we get into uh, the webinar? So I wanted to just start off by talking a little bit about laparoscopic adrenalectomy in people. You know, first described early 90s, you know, kind of after the laparoscopic cholecystectomy revolution that happened and, uh, you know, first initially performed for pheochromocytoma uh, or hypoadrenal corticism. Uh, you know, one thing that's a little bit different, I'm just going to get my pointer up here, is that in people, the anatomy is a little bit different. No surprise, you know, I don't have the vascular structures outlined in this schematic, but the adrenal gland is, again, it's more, more at the cranial pole of, the, of our kidneys, but it seems to be much farther away from any major vascular structures. You know, that's unlike in dogs. So interesting difference, maybe makes our jobs a little bit easier doing adrenalectomy in, in um, you know, in our patients. And, you know, no surprise as the, as the decades have gone on, as this procedure has kind of been honed in uh, people, you know, it's become the standard of care for many benign adrenal lesions and numerous uh, meta-analyses have shown kind of the usual benefits. So reduced hospitalization time, reduced post-operative pain, you know, lower blood loss compared to open surgery. Now, I say this for many benign adrenal lesions. However, there is an exception, and that's adrenal cortical carcinoma. So with this disease, which is, you know, probably the most common reason we are doing adrenalectomy in dogs anyways, uh, a, a different type of cortical tumors in cats, but in dogs, you know, adrenal cortical carcinoma, it seems to be a different beast. In people, we know, although it's, a, it's rare, it's a highly malignant tumor. There's a high recurrence rate, uh, depending on, you know, the surgical technique performed. Uh, 
tumor stage at the time of diagnosis versus in dogs, it seems like adrenal cortical carcinoma is a much more benign disease. And I think, you know, that's to our benefit. You know, what has been the concerns with actually performing laparoscopy in people for adrenal cortical carcinoma? Well, you know, we, we just discussed, it seems like uh, it is a malignant, highly malignant tumor. And so, you know, if you look in the literature, there is concerns with uh, the margins available or that can be taken using laparoscopy compared to open surgery. There's concerns with peritoneal carcinomatosis or local recurrence. And again, depending on the publication or the article that you read, you know, there's a lot of controversy surrounding whether laparoscopy should be attempted for adrenal cortical carcinoma. Maybe there's a size cutoff where laparoscopy should be used. So it's a very interesting debate still in 2021 in people. Uh, whereas I think in dogs, you know, it's a, it's a much more benign disease, fortunately, not to say that local recurrence can happen or that, uh, you know, obeying oncological principles at the time of laparoscopy isn't important. Just that it seems to be a, a much uh, less benign or a much more benign disease uh, compared to people. What about in our world? What are some indications? You know, probably a very experienced um, group of you that are tuning in. And so, um, you know, you know that in dogs, adrenocortical tumors, either adenoma or carcinoma that may or may not be functional, though that's a very common, probably the most common indication in dogs. Tumors ari arising from the adrenal medulla, so pheochromocytomas, you know, another indication. Um, cats can also uh, get adrenal disease, much, much less common than in dogs. It seems like aldosterone secreting tumors arising from the adrenal cortex seems to be the most common type. And, uh, you know, we will touch on that towards the end of the presentation. What about the incidental OMA? You know, the, the adrenal gland mass that seems to be, uh, that gets discovered at the time of some type of imaging for an unrelated disease. And I think this kind of relates to the question whether, does, whether every adrenal mass that gets diagnosed, does that need to go to surgery to be removed? You know, it's an it's a interesting question. Uh, there's an interesting study done by um, Dr. Jared Baum uh, back in 2016, and they looked at, you know, almost 300 uh, dogs that had abdominal CT for uh, reasons, predominantly um, staging for neoplasia. Almost 10% of those dogs had uh, an adrenal mass that was found incidentally. Now, do all of those need to get removed? You know, probably not. It's, it's a tough one, though, because some owners, you know, if a family finds, or finds out or learns that their dog has an adrenal mass, you know, perhaps they, they feel or, or believe that that may be some type of a ticking time bomb and they want to get that out. And, you know, while that may be reasonable in, in some respects, I think monitoring that is also reasonable, especially if it's not creating or resulting in any clinical signs. Really interesting study, uh, you know, done by um, Dr. Cook and at Al in um, 2014. You know, they looked at ultrasound findings in incidental adrenal gland lesions, and they found that malignancy was more likely in glands or in tumors that were greater than 20 millimeters. And I actually really like that measurement, something that uh, you know our group uses, something that's less than. 20 millimeters or two centimeters, you know, I think, and, and especially if it's an incidental finding, you know, I think we, uh, we definitely will say that, you know, monitoring is absolutely reasonable. Why don't you have this checked out again in a couple of months to make sure it's not growing and definitely let us know if there's any signs that uh, could be a result of this, come back in and we can reevaluate re your dog. So certainly it's something to think about. I don't know if every adrenal mass needs to be removed. Probably not. You know, some of these will, uh, will 
remain at bay for a long, long time. Ultimately, you know, if you do discover an adrenal gland mass, you know, at some type of endocrinological testing is absolutely indicated. I think it's really important to determine, is this a functional tumor? You may already know that by some of the clinical signs uh, in which the dog is presenting. So trying to figure out whether this is cortical in origin, is this a dog that's presenting with hyperadrenal corticism versus something medullary like a pheochromocytoma that can have a very, you know, insidious course? You know, our group, we, we might start off with an ACTH stimulation test. If we are worried that this is, uh, <clears throat> you know, potentially an adrenal gland tumor that can get followed up with a low dose dexamethasone suppression test that can certainly further characterize hyperadrenal corticism. And, you know, that might lead us to do further imaging of the abdomen resulting or, or, you know, helping us diagnose an adrenal gland mass. You know, our group, and I think many groups are also very active in, uh, you know, hemostasis work and thromboelastography. You know, our group is, is very keen on that. And we, we're seeing to be, um, you know, using this value. If you can see the graph kind of in the, the bottom corner here. This is a, a, a very classic or just a standard readout for a thromboelastogram. Uh, something that, you know, we know that dogs with hyperadrenal corticism, they can be procoagulable. And so something that we measure on our hyperadrenal corticism cases. So if we do diagnose hyperadrenal corticism. You know, this is a result of, uh, you know, adrenal cortical tumor that's excessively secreting cortisol. We will treat or pre-treat these dogs with trilostane. It's a drug that, you know, will bind that steroid. The dose is provided. We'll usually do that for two to three weeks prior to surgery. And it, it seems to work really well. You know, owners will report clinical signs, you know, so most classic PUPD uh, seems to, uh, you know, stop very quickly after the onset of this drug. Uh, you know, I, I must say there's, there's not a huge evidence base for the use of this prior to surgery. That being said, you know, we think it's, it's a very good thing to do, especially, uh, you know, the consideration of you know, these dogs may be being procoagulable and, uh, you know, concerns for that in the perioperative period. If we're, if we're working up, uh, you know, an adrenal mass and we are not, we've ruled out a adrenal cortical tumor, we're either worried this is uh, at least a functional adrenal cortical tumor we've ruled out and we're worried that this tumor could be a pheochromocytoma or you know, we don't know. It could be a, an adrenal cortical tumor that's non-functional. Regardless, we will treat these cases with phenoxybenzamine. You can see the dose. Uh, and this, this is a drug that's an alpha adrenergic antagonist. It irreversibly binds these alpha one and two receptors. And, you know, this is, uh, you know, these recommendations is from this paper back in 2008. It end of the day, it showed that dogs that were, you know, that had pheochromocytomas that were pre-treated with <clears throat> phenoxybenzamine, they had significantly decreased mortality. So, you know, this seems to be a pretty common practice. Uh, the one challenge is, is that some of these dogs you know, I had one recently that may not handle the phenoxybenzamine. It, it kind of switches, uh, you know, you know, the signs related to uh, at least if a dog's clinical from a pheochromocytoma, they can have, you know, hypertension and the phenoxybenzamine may switch them more towards being hypotensive. They can, uh, you know, really not feel well on this drug. And I have had one dog recently that we needed to remove or, or stop the phenoxybenzamine prior to surgery. So, you know, something to consider, we definitely start these dogs uh, on this drug and then get them back within a few days just to make sure everything is, is well. You know, the duration, what is ideal? We don't know. Uh, generally, I, I use about a week to two weeks if possible. 
you know, in that dog that I mentioned that didn't tolerate the phenoxybenzamine that well, we weren't sure was, was it a pheo? Was it just a non-functional adrenocortical tumor? And, you know, one diagnostic test that's done a lot in people is testing for urine metanephrines. It's another, uh, you know, molecule that gets secreted from the adrenal gland. And it has been shown that, uh, you know, metanephrine levels are significantly higher in dogs with pheochromocytoma versus uh, normal healthy dogs. So we actually ran metanephrine testing in that dog. It's not something that we commonly do. It'd be really interesting to start doing it more. It is a little bit costly right now, uh, at least at our institution, and we have to send that off. But we actually ran metanephrine in that dog. It came back normal, so it was not a uh, you know was was not consistent with a pheo, and so we didn't pretreat that dog at all uh, after it had a poor response on phenoxybenzamine. Took the dog to surgery. It ended up being a um, you know adrenal cortical tumor that was non-functional. So everything worked out very well for that case. Something that, something to think about as far as urine metanephrine testing in a situation like that, um, or you know if you want to learn more whether whether the case that you may be working up is a pheochromocytoma or not, uh, you know, and that kind of brings me really interesting study just to kind of wrap up the discussion on pretreatment. Um, really interesting study that that just came out in the Australian Veterinary Journal, um, really active group that um, reported their experience in 65 dogs that had adrenalectomy that did not have any type of pretreatment prior to surgery. They had mortality only in, in one of 65 dogs. Really interesting study. You know, they, they did highlight that the evidence base for pretreatment for either a adrenocortical or a medullary tumor is, is scant at best. And, uh, you know, their experience in a reasonable number of dogs was, was really good. I think, you know, tying this back to laparoscopic adrenalectomy, I think for me, most of these, especially if we're trying laparoscopy, these are probably going to be, or, or probably should be elective cases. And I think that does allow us to pre-treat and, um, you know, whether, whether the evidence base is there or not for it, I, I do think it, it can help in either in whether the dog has a cortical or a medullary tumor. Um, you know, I think obviously there's more work to be done there and we need to definitively answer that question. Uh, but, you know, I think for now, I'm gonna continue to uh, pre-treat my cases. So diagnostic imaging, I think absolutely essential. Uh, you know, we mentioned ultrasound kind of, I think it's a really good screening tool. Uh, you know, you have a diagnosis where, uh, you know, the sonographer provides a size. It's uh, <clears throat> reasonably sensitive for detecting some more features of the tumor. But I think if you are, you know, considering going to surgery on a case, I really think you need to consider doing a CT. It provides really great three-dimensional anatomy, uh, a lot more information than ultrasonography, and ultimately can, you know, let you know whether this case is a good idea for minimally invasive surgery or not. It's more sensitive for determining vascular invasion, which is a big thing. And if there is any vascular invasion that's detected, then you know that's certainly something that should be performed uh, or that case should be performed by open surgery. I mean, you know, there's a lot of features that can be, uh, you know, evaluated on a CT. So this is a, a really classic, this is a coronal uh, or your dorsal CT image. This is going to be the right kidney. Here's the left kidney. This is the, uh, you know, the, the left adrenal gland, and there's a large mass on the cranial pole of the left adrenal gland. I'm going to show you a bunch of CTs uh, coming up, but it is important to decipher cranial or caudal pole. Uh, you know, I think on the left side, especially, but also on the right, it's really important to understand the relationship of this tumor to the renal vein. And, you know, this case, this is kind of like your dream case that you would, you know, this would be something that you would love to see on any case that you were going to take for laparoscopy. Uh, some other 
uh, vascular trunks here. This is a celiac, cranial mesenteric, and you know, understanding the relationship to uh, your tumor in question is, is really important. And I think, you know, this does this modality as far as CT. It it's definitely been shown to be much more sensitive than than ultrasound alone. So, what cases? can be performed using laparoscopy. I think it's really important to critically evaluate your CT. Uh, you know, there has been some discussion, three to four, less than three to four centimeters. I think that's that's very reasonable. You, you don't wanna see any, or, you know, I, the cases that you want to take with laparoscopy shouldn't have any vascular invasion into the cranial vena cava. So this is the vena cava. So the liver, we've got the right kidney just coming into view. Here's the, the left renal, the left kidney. We've got a, a caudal pole, left adrenaline mass. This is, uh, you know, very close and, you know, an intimate association with this left renal vein, looking for that attachment or, or concerns for any invasion into that renal vasculature, you know, contraindications for laparoscopy. You know, I think this image, this is going to be a very challenging case just with its uh, association with the renal vein. Uh, you know, I've heard some people saying, try to do just left-sided tumors early on in your learning curve with laparoscopy. I don't necessarily think that, um, and, and the reason was because that's an easier side to get. I don't necessarily think that's always the case. And, and you know, this image provides a great example where this is going to be a fairly challenging procedure where the caudal pole mass is, is, you know, like I said, intimately associated with that renal vein. And, uh, you know, some of these right-sided ones, yes, they can be close to the cava, but I think they can be less challenging than, than something like this on the left side. So don't always fall into, um, you know, some of that dogma as far as left-sided tumors only. All right, so I'm gonna put up some, some CTs here and, uh, you know, I, I would love to, if we were in person, I'd love to get your opinions on this, whether you do this open or not, or, or MIS or not, uh, but maybe I'll, I'll just carry on here for obvious reasons. So 10-year-old female spade, German shepherd, you know, classic case, presenting with PUPD, uh, hyperadrenocorticism, diagnosed with uh, endocrinological testing, adrenal, uh, you know, consistent with an adrenal dependent uh, disease on low dose dexamethasone suppression test. And here's the CT scan. You know, like I said, this was that, I'm just rolling the video of that dream lesion, you know, and, and the reason that I say this is your dream lesion is that, you know, left-sided cranial pole far away from this renal vein, far away from the vena cava, you know, yes, it's close to this celiac cranial mesenteric trunk, but, you know, again, I've, I'm, I've only showed this one view. If you look at the sagittal or axial views, uh, you would see that, uh, you know, you do have a nice area or a plane away from those two major vessels. So I think, you know, for sure, this is a great case for laparoscopy and, you know, that dream case that, you know, you would love to see every time. All right, here's the next one. So this was an incidental finding, uh, you know, it's a, a seven-year-old schnauzer uh, presented for, uh, you know, suspected GI disease uh, that led to a, a workup, endocrinological workup. And, um, you know, a CT was performed after suspicion for adrenal gland mass was, uh, was found on ultrasound. I'm just gonna pause the CT. You know, this is a, a, a really, again, like I said, really critically evaluate the CT scans. You know, here is the renal vein coming from the cranial vena cava, and we've got an adrenal gland mass, no doubt, but we've got invasion into the cranial vena cava. So this is a case that, uh, you know, definitely not a good candidate for laparoscopy. Certainly anytime you have cranial vena cava invasion, needed to, you need to do open surgery. And we ended up doing a cavotomy uh, where we you know, isolated the cava, then subsequently made an incision into the cava. And there's that, the thrombus from that adrenal gland mass. So, you know, really important to critically evaluate your CT scans. So another case, 
older Bichon. Again, I've showed you a still image of this case. Left-sided disease really, really intimately associated with that left renal vein. And, and again, I've said this, this is going to be a challenge to peel that tumor away from that left renal vein. You know, be prepared for a uh, you know challenging dissection there. If that plane uh, associated with the renal vein is fibrous, then you know you may need to convert to open surgery. So it's certainly you know I, I really feel like the the CT is so important. It provides so much information, very helpful for discussion with the owner, and then you know just getting yourself into that mindset on uh, you know again whether this is that dream case that I showed a few slides earlier or a little bit more of a challenging uh, case as seen in this um, CT where it's so closely adherent or potentially adherent and associated with left renal vein. This was a, a, an older chow, so last case where uh, you know we we're suspecting a, a pheochromocytoma just based on clinical signs. Uh, we did the we did a CT scan. And this was a right sided. This is more on the on the cranial pole. Uh, you know certainly it it is a little bit scary when you see how closely intimate uh, associated and intimately associated the tumor is with the vena cava. But you know, I don't think. Certainly, I think that it's worth trying laparoscopy and and, and seeing how far along you can get with these cases, uh, because I think you'd surprise yourself. And and just careful, slow dissection, as we'll see, uh, can can find some of those tighter planes along that vena cava. All right. So I thought I'd uh, just take a quick break here and see if there was any questions from the from the group. Yeah, there are uh, a couple of questions. Uh, one is, I don't know if this is still the case, but I remember that the last couple of years, phenoxybenzamine had become quite costly in some parts of the U.S. and wondered if uh, that's affordable in Canada. Do we send all our Yeah, that's a great question. Them? Yeah, I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to see those. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. We, uh, um, for a lot of cases, we have to compound whether it's, you know, phenoxy or, um, <clears throat> or trilostane. You know, I think um, the other drug that has been discussed is prazosin that has a similar mechanism of action. And so if in, in your area, if phenoxy is becoming cost prohibitive, that's something that can be considered. It's a slightly different pharmacologically, but you know, it is still an alpha blocker. So something to consider. You could also reach out to your local compounding and see if that, um, you know, if, if that would solve any of the uh, cost issues, probably unlikely, but, um, you know, certainly worth looking into. Yeah. Do you anticoagulate your patients uh, preoperatively? Yeah, really great question. Thanks for bringing that up. You know, certainly um, there are some institutions, some groups that still heparinize uh, their, their cases. Um, we used to do that. We haven't done that for a long time. Uh, and I think, again, maybe for these hyperadrenocortical um, tumors, uh, you know, the trilostane, maybe that's helping us try to mitigate some of the concerns associated with being pro or hypercoagulable. The heparin, you know, we've just shied away from it. It, when we've had good success without it, uh, it seemed like it was a big deal to try to, you know, slowly wean those dogs off the heparin. And, um, you know, with, since we've sort of shied away from it, we haven't seen any untoward consequences. So we've kind of stayed the course without it. I do know some institutions still do that. Uh, we noticed on your CT scans, most all of them were left adrenals. Is, do you have any statistics? Is it more common left or right? Uh, uh, no, that's, that's just me. I just picked, you know, I just got some CT scans that, um, you know, I, I put in this presentation that kind of showed them, but I, you know, I think it's still pretty, pretty 50, 50. Okay. Uh, I don't, I don't know what the, you know, I'd have to look up the exact stats on, um, you know, some of the, the last few papers that are out there, but 
you know, I think it's totally fair to say that, uh, you know, it's still 50-50 disease, despite my bias, I guess, here for, you know, showing these left-sided CT scans. So, okay. Um, there was one question. Um, you talk about caudal pole versus cranial pole. Can you kind of define yeah. that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I'm just going to go back in my presentation. So sorry about that. I should have defined that a bit more. So I'm just going to uh, highlight with my pointer is, uh, you know, this is the adrenal gland mass. The adrenal, the normal adrenal, it's split by, if you can kind of see a hyperattenuating structure, that's the phrenico-abdominal vein. And so underneath my pointer is the caudal pole. And when it's a caudal pole mass, I get very concerned about its association with the renal vein versus if it's a cranial pole. So, you know, again, cranial to where that phrenico abdominal vein is, you know, a different concern. Maybe you were less concerned with the cranial pole tumors association with the renal vein. Okay. So I hope that made sense. Certainly let me know if, uh, if it didn't. I think it probably did. Um, I think that's all we have for now. Okay, great. All right, so I'll, I'll carry on. You know, I think ultimately, whether it's with laparoscopic adrenalectomy or any type of minimally invasive procedure, you know, case selection is absolutely critical for success. You know, I think not just early on in learning in your learning curve, but any time, I mean, if, if you have tumors larger than three or four centimeters, uh, you know, maybe consider an open approach. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll share some of my experiences and, uh, you know, you can, you can decide on, on your own on where you at with where you are at with your learning curve. Obviously some of these smaller tumors, just less challenges with, uh, you know, close adherence or association with some of the vascular structures that are in the area. Some of the other contraindications for doing laparoscopy, obviously if there's vascular invasion, whether it's into the cranial vena cava or rarely into the renal vein, there's periadrenal hemorrhage, which we, uh, you know, sometimes see, we sometimes, it's, it's rare, but we sometimes see that on emergency basis presenting as hemoabdomen, uh, or if, you know, some of these really invasive adrenal tumors where they're invading into the epaxial muscles. Those are the major contraindications for uh, using laparoscopy for adrenalectomy. Okay, so some key instrumentation. I think uh, a really, really important part of this is that if you're going to go down the, you know, the laparoscopy route for adrenalectomy or any other procedure, you really have to have the right instruments for success. Uh, you know, as a standard, uh, standard endoscope, five millimeter. I, I really like the 30 degree telescope. It's just helpful looking around corners and such, but not essential. I apologize for my, my slide. I have a traumatic graspers here. That should be sitting in this black space here. So that's really important. Some type of atraumatic grasper, whether it's, uh, you know, you can have a, use a Babcock, uh, but there are some nice atraumatic graspers that you'll see in some of the videos that, uh, you know, can help you gently manipulate some of the tissues around the adrenal. Uh, I, I really like these threaded uh, cannulas, really nice, not essential, but you know, you do need three to four cannulas. Uh, you, you may have a single port multi-channel device as seen here. This is the SILS port from, uh, you know, Medtronic Covidian. Uh, and that's really handy, especially in some larger dogs. We'll show you how that setup goes. A couple of other key instrumentations. And I think, you know, these ones that I've mentioned, I think if you're into laparoscopy, you've probably got these pieces of equipment already, but you know, these pieces that I'm going to discuss absolutely essential for adrenalectomy. The first thing is this J hook monopolar electrosurgery tip. This tip is absolutely, I feel absolutely essential. It's really nice for dissecting in some of those tight planes around the renal vein, around the vena cava, really helpful. And what this does, this tip, it just clicks into your monopolar electrosurgery handpiece. So really handy, 
really easy to interchange. Second, I think, again, very helpful, especially in some of the more vascular dissections that need to happen, is this trumpet valve suction uh, unit. The trumpet valve is nice because, you know, you can depress and uh, do this intermittently when you're in the abdomen and not completely lose your working space. So if you, you know, if you hold this down or they have suction tips that are continuous, you know, you'll just remove all of the CO2 in the abdomen. So the trumpet valve is, is very nice. Those are really important. Um, specimen, specimen retrieval bag, very important as well. Again, obeying oncological principles. Most of these are neoplastic and we don't want to, you know, seed any of our port site incisions. So putting that specimen in the uh, uh, retrieval bag prior to extraction from the abdomen, you know, is really important. Okay, just getting into operating room setup, you know, let's pretend that, uh, you know, we are doing a left adrenalectomy, you know, I guess I am biased in this lecture already. So, you know, we'll continue with this schematic. You know, the uh, dog is lying in almost nearly right lateral recumbency. I'll show you my setup on the next slide um, with the left side, you know, more dorsally located. The surgical team is, is standing on that same side. And the monitor will, uh, you know, ideally is placed directly across from you, and then your instrument table is off to the side. And so here's kind of my setup. So one thing, uh, you know, and I think it's it's important to, you know, have a, a plan for your surgery. You know, obviously we're trying this laparoscopic. We are really hopeful that's going to be successful. But if you need to convert, you know, I, I want you to think about that and, you know, how that's going to go. And so I, you know, I have the, the animal, so that this is the dog's head to the left, obviously the back end to the right. I, I still have the ventral midline, you know, clipped and prepped because if I need to convert to an open laparotomy, I still prefer going through ventral midline you know, I know some surgeons will convert and do a pericostal laparotomy. I'm still, and this is just me, my, my own preference. If I have to convert, I, I still go through ventral midline. So I have the dog sort of tilted. You know, again, we're, we're doing a left adrenalectomy in this case. I have the dog kind of tilted 45 degrees to the right. I will drape the ventral midline in and then perhaps tilt the dog maybe another 15 degrees to the right. So that's the setup, and it's very helpful to have that left limb tied. So this is a, you know, this is that same same dog with ports placed. Couple of key points here, and you know, there's nothing fancy about the port placement. You know, standard principles as far as trying to triangulate all of your ports around where that you know, where your lesion is, in this case, obviously the adrenal gland. So, you know, I was you know, definitely in talking with several of my mentors at the VES, you know, I initially would, would place my port sub umbilical, you know, right on ventral midline, which is located here. And then, you know, in discussion, I think it was, uh, you know, either with, with Phil Mayhew uh, or, or Gilles Dupre, they suggested, you know, why don't you place ports three to five centimeters, again, depending on the size of the animal, you know, place, place your initial endoscopic port in a paramedian location. And what that does, it allows you to kind of look a bit, you know, vertically on top of the adrenal gland and you get a much better view. Okay, so I, I recommend that. This was a larger dog. So I placed the Sills port in a paramedian location, that needs a, a 2.5 centimeter incision for insertion. You know, I probably won't do a sills port in a smaller dog, just because you know two and a half centimeters is fairly big in, in a in a you know less than 10 kilo dog. So with that paramedian port, whether it's a, a sills port or you know a standard six millimeter port, you know that's your starting base. You get your insufflation, and then you know you can add ports as needed. I really like to have four ports in. I have the, the paramedian port with the endoscope. You can place an instrument or, or two additional ones through the sills. Um, but I, I really, when I'm doing fine dissection, I, I want to have some triangulation. So I, I use kind of a minimum of two other instrument ports. 
And then that fourth port is really nice for manipulating the kidney out of the way or putting some tension on the kidney, uh, you know, just so that you can um, perform that retroperitoneal dissection uh, much easier. And I'll show you examples of that coming up. So there's the, the port placement in a, in a smaller dog, you know, too small for me to put the sills in the paramedian location. This is cranial. You know, this is the this is the left side of the abdomen. It's in right lateral recumbency. Instrument port, instrument port, and then our fourth port for retraction. Okay, so you know maybe I can clarify a little bit on cranial versus caudal pole. This is just a schematic diagram again of uh, you know some of the vascular structures associated with the adrenal gland. So we've got the right right kidney here the intimately associated right adrenal gland with the caudal vena cava. You know, there's a lot of feeding vessels from the uh, cava itself, from the aorta, from the renal artery, renal vein, and these are all different adrenal artery or vein branches. Certainly when there's neoplasia, there's parasitism of all of these blood supplies to create, you know, many different small vascular supplies to this gland now that's you know undergone you know neoplastic transformation and so be aware of those you know it's it certainly can create some nuisance bleeding uh, but just be aware that there's going to be you know a little bit more vascular supply to the adrenal gland again when there's a tumor here is you know the left adrenal gland the phrenico-abdominal vein is bisecting the adrenal gland so cranial pole caudal pole. One thing I, I do want to point out, and this has caused me fits in some cases, is, you know, we oftentimes get very, uh, you know, concerned with this portion of the phrenico-abdominal vein. We want to seal that. And once we seal that, you know, we feel like we are kind of home free with the rest of the adrenal gland. But do not forget that this vessel, uh, you know, it, it continues on and carries on laterally. This is the cranial abdominal branch. And so that's always needing to be sealed as well. So don't forget about that vessel as you're coming around the lateral caudal aspect of the gland. If you don't, you know, if you accidentally go through that, it can cause, um, you know, considerable bleeding, something that you, you likely can take care of. But I think if you're aware and know that this vessel is, is there, it's in that caudal lateral location, you know, you'll keep an eye out for it and conceal it prior to, uh, you know, causing any trouble. All right, so let's, let's get into some procedural details. Start off with the left side. What are some keys to this, to your success? You know, again, like I mentioned, looking at the CT scan, I think understanding whether this is going to be a cranial pole tumor as seen, you know, in the bottom left, Here's the left kidney, cranial is to the left, large cranial pole tumor or a caudal pole tumor. You know, you can just barely see it. It's just nestled under the, uh, under the kidney. You know, that is going to tell you, or you, you know, you can get a gauge on how difficult this procedure is going to be. You know, I did mention, I really like to put tension on the kidney and that just opens up this dissection plane. And that's, you know, that's generally where I would recommend starting. It's nice to, you know, you can continue on either direction depending on what pole or where the tumor is located. And, you know, it's, it's nice to identify where that phrenico-abdominal vein is, seal that, and then work cranial and caudal lateral after that doesn't always go like that. It really depends on the location of the tumor. But, uh, you know, that's generally a nice starting point is in this retroperitoneal um, attachments and then working towards identifying and sealing that phrenico-abdominal vein. Really, you know, really be cautious with that renal vein and always know where that structure is, especially if you have a caudal pole tumor. So here's a few procedural videos. Um, this is that, you know, again, it's that dream lesion that, uh, you know, is a cranial pole tumor. We've just started to open up that area uh, in between the 
kidney and the adrenal gland. And now we're just opening up. This is that J-hook electrosurgical tip, monopolar, really nice. This is that peritoneum now that's overlying the adrenal gland. Phrenico-abdominal vein is in view. And, you know, just using some hemostats, laparoscopic Kelly forceps, just to dissect and, and try to clear that plane for sealing of that phrenico-abdominal vein. So once we, you know, once we dissect that, we can place a vessel sealer. You can also use endoscopic clips. That's been described. I think, you know, the vessel sealer, if you've got that, it's just a little bit uh, more convenient to use and, uh, you know, very handy for continuing the dissection. We're now continuing medially and cranially. And once that phrenico-abdominal vein is sealed, you know, we feel pretty happy. There's an example or a view of that trumpet valve suction tip. Very helpful. Some of that, a little, just a little bit of nuisance hemorrhage. Using that five millimeter vessel sealing jaws, we can use that as a dissection instrument as well. And now here is that cranial abdominal branch of the phrenico-abdominal artery and vein. So it's important to seal that, otherwise that can cause you fits from hemorrhage. And, uh, you know, once that's sealed, this is now we're, we're just getting up that small caudal pole and freeing its attachments. So that's a really nice lesion to remove laparoscopically, uh, you know, and, and I think not overly challenging, again, given the CT findings. Showing some more examples. This is of ones that we've seen before. This is that same tumor that's very closely associated with that renal vein. So caudal pole tumor, phrenico-abdominal vein here, renal vein swinging out to the right. And, you know, I'm just using a cotton tipped swab, very gently opening that plane. Here is the renal vein. You know, I'm very careful here. If this was any type of a fibrous plane, I would convert to open surgery. You know, I don't want to, you know, I think if a renal vein gets torn, that's pretty much resulting in nephrectomy, I think. I don't think, I think it's challenging. It's going to be challenging to suture that without it thrombosing. And so, you know, we, we were fortunate in this case. It was not a fibrous plane. We were able to just gently dissect this away from the renal vein and, you know, then perform the adrenalectomy. But again, you know, definitely no hesitation in converting if this plane with the renal vein or, you know, in another lesion with the vena cava, if that's a bit fibrous and you are not able to open that up in any way, you know, I think very quick conversion to open surgery before, you know, you run into any difficulties. So again, you know, we were able to open that up. Um, we see the renal artery now. Uh, you know, pulsing in, in the background. And, you know, this plane now I think is very easy. We can, we can get our J hook uh, in there just to free that up now that we have some room away from that renal vein. Okay, so, you know, let's talk about the right side. Certainly, uh, you know, we know that the adrenal gland capsule is continuous with the tunica externa of the vena cava and, and that, you know, immediately that, uh, you know, sends chills down our spine. It's, um, you know, closely associated with the vena cava. Again, that's where that J hook comes in really nice at finding that tight plane with the vena cava. Suction, very helpful as well. And, and, you know, as I've mentioned, I think if there's any concerns, just, you know, you, converting readily, no, no concerns with that. So this is a right-sided lesion, caudal, caudal pole. Actually, this was more of a, a, you know, it was a cranial and caudal pole diffuse adrenal mass. Kidney is to the, the left-hand side of the, the screen. This is that cranial abdominal branch that we just sealed. Here's the adrenal gland mass, and it's closely associated with the cava right here. So what we're doing, we just dissected that phrenico-abdominal vein, sealed that. So we feel like, you know, th those major pressure points are taken care of. And now we know, again, based on our CT, this mass is not invading into the cava. So we, you know, again, we just need to take some care and, and gently dissect in here against that cable plane. 
And, uh, you know, that, that J hook, I, I speak very highly of this instrument in situations like this. You can put that J portion of the tip in there as we're doing, really make sure that you have a translucent, you know, piece of tissue overlying that tip. And then just very gently tap your, your, um, energy and uh, take that plane away. And, you know, just being caution, understanding that we're, you know, we're only millimeters away from the cava. Uh, you know, you can just very gently work your way into this scenario where now we are, uh, you know, we're, we're not, you know, we're not eons or, or, or kilometers away from that cava, but, you know, we had enough room there to uh, generate a, a greater dissection plane, certainly allow us to bring in our, our vessel sealer and, uh, you know, take that down. So there's an example of a, you know, a reasonably straightforward right side in adrenalectomy. This was a bit more of a challenging case. I don't have the CT up on, on this one. This dog, I, I recall very clearly, it came in for a liver mass, a left-sided liver mass, and an incidental adrenal gland mass was found at that time. And, uh, you know, we did the liver lobectomy. We wanted to send the dog uh, or ensure the dog recovered and send the dog home after the liver lobectomy prior to tackling the adrenal gland mass. So we brought the dog back after some pre-treatment and, uh, you know, the liver was very much adherent to this adrenal gland mass. I don't know if that would have happened or if that was, you know, as a result of us already being in there a, a month prior. Suction's absolutely critical for us here. This trumpet valve, we're just slowly kind of peeling that liver attachment from the adrenal gland. And, uh, you know, it's, it's created a lot of nuisance hemorrhage. It, it wasn't enough at this point in time for us to convert to open surgery. Certainly, if you have any concerns with visualization or unable to, uh, you know, find the planes that you need to, you know, I, cer I certainly think conversion is fine. We, we battled through it a little bit. We we're able to, you know, get the adrenal gland completely dissected uh, away from all the liver attachment until just the phrenico-abdominal vein was left. And uh, now we're placing the vessel sealers against that phrenico-abdominal vein. You know, it is, you might find yourselves in a tight situation like this where the vessel sealing jaws are very close to the vena cava. Unfortunately, in, in many cases, that might be all the room that you're going to get. The other option in a case like this, especially when you are so tight with the vena cava, is to place some endoscopic clips. So that would be a, a second option if vessel sealing, um, you know, if you don't have enough room to place that vessel sealer across that phrenico-abdominal, you know, a very short, stumpy phrenico-abdominal vein. So that was a, you know, more of a, a challenging case. And, and certainly, you know, I think when we ran into a bit of hemorrhage, more of a nuisance hemorrhage, uh, <clears throat> you know, certainly I think conversion wouldn't have been a bad idea in that case, especially if we were struggling to see. Specimen retrieval, a couple of options. Like I said, the specimen retrieval bag, you know, these, you know, probably as you know, they, these are um, commercially available. You certainly, um, certainly will use them for a variety of different lesions. But, you know, with adrenalectomy, I do think it's important that we, um, you know, protect our port edges in, um, you know, this is, a, this is a cat that we are just placing in the thumb of a surgical glove. So kind of a homemade um, specimen retrieval bag that's, you know, achieving the same protection of our port site edges. Uh, wondering if there's any more questions at this time. Yeah, there were um, a couple of questions. One of which is, uh, it seems like when you're using your vessel sealer, uh, you're using five millimeter um, uh, vessel sealers. Is that what you recommend? Should I get yeah, I uh, think, uh, five if I try an adrenal gland? Yeah, I think a five millimeter is definitely the way to go. The 10 millimeter, it's a, it's a nice instrument for sure. It's just, it's just jaws are quite large. And, you know, quite often, I know many surgeons are using the five millimeter that the tips are, are really nice for doing some dissection, maybe not some of the finer dissection, 
but um, you know, you can still do a fair amount with it. So I would, I would recommend the five millimeter for sure. Uh, another question is, do you think ultrasonic dissection and coagulation should be advantageous in those cases? Yeah, great comment. We've, we've talked about that for sure. Um, I, I have not personally used it, but I think that would be, you know, I know surgeons that have, and I think that would be absolutely fine. Uh, here's a question. Hopefully you've never had this happen, but if you encounter bleeding associated with a tear in the vena cava, how quickly can you convert to an open procedure? Yeah, great question. Fortunately, knock on wood, I've not had that happen. Um, you know that I, so I have the dog rotated into almost, you know, almost lateral recumbency, but I have the ventral midline prepped and draped into the field. So, you know, I just, if we need to convert readily, you know, certainly we can, we can make that happen within a few minutes. Oh. Just by tilting the dog back into dorsal recumbency and then, you know, standard laparotomy at that time. Uh also, uh, we have one final question. The use of diathermy in the right adrenal could cause scarification as it avoids. Um, uh, so is that a problem, I guess, is what the question was? Um, and I, if we're doing a, a right adrenal versus a left? Yeah, I guess probably being closer to the vena cava. Yeah, good question. You know, it doesn't seem to, um, you know, always cautious about that. And that's what I mean. If you have a very short, you know, I'm more worried about, you know, burning a hole in the vena cava if I'm very close, if there's a short stump of that phrenico abdominal vein. And, uh, you know, the other option there in, in a situation like that is to place endoscopic clips. Okay. I think that's it for questions. Okay. I will, you know, I'm just watching the time. I might carry on just for a few more minutes. Sure. And then, uh, you know, can certainly take a, any more questions. Does that sound all right, Dave? Yeah, that's fine. You know, I want to just share some of my experiences, probably, you know, not some of my finest pieces of work, uh, especially on this next case that I wanted to share with you. Uh, and I think, you know, some complications, it's always important to discuss that. And that's probably how I'll, uh, you know, end, end the um, discussion tonight. So I think case selection, we talked about it, very, very important. This was a, a large breed dog came in, you know, you can see the CT scan. Uh, this is the coronal image. This is a 3D view. This is a giant adrenal tumor. It's about six to seven centimeters in longest dimension. You know, the owner came, he was really keen on, uh, you know, me doing laparoscopy. I said, you know, I'm concerned with the size. He said, look, why don't you start with laparoscopy and see how it goes? You know, it, it shockingly with the size of it, it hadn't invaded into the vena cava and the renal vein. So, you know, this is, this is where we're at at lap time of laparoscopy. You know, quite a large tumor, obviously not a surprise given the CT. We did end up getting it out laparoscopic. It, you know, it, it took a, a longer than it would have if we did this open, there's no doubt. And, and one thing here to note, and you can see on the specimen, this is obviously after we removed it uh, on the right, the image on the right, there was a small amount of capsular rupture that occurred. And, uh, you know, we, we have talked about this at the start of the presentation, you know, that adrenocortical carcinoma, which this was, the dog was showing PUPD, uh, and, and that prompted this workup. <laughs> you know, this capsular rupture, adrenocortical carcinoma, what does that mean? We know in dogs seems to be a much much more of a benign disease than in, in people. And so we haven't been too, too worried when there's capsular rupture of the tumor, which is something that, you know, is not really obeying oncolog principles. Really need to be stringent on those. Obviously, you know, capsular rupture sometimes occurs even in open surgery. Uh, but, you know, I don't know, maybe if I had done this open, maybe this capsular rupture would not have happened. And this was four years ago now. And, you know, I've, I've talked about this case, um, you know, many times, you know, there, there was no recurrence. We've been following this dog. Actually, within the last few months, this dog developed a recurrence and recurrence of clinical signs. Bottom line here, I think, you know, this was poor case selection on my part. This is a giant tumor. I probably should have done this straight open not even tried laparoscopy. And, um, you know, I think that 
capsular rupture may have happened at the time of open surgery, but maybe not. And so, you know, that's something, uh, you know, I really needed, uh, you know, I should have observed better case selection at that time. Something to keep in mind. You know, we were just talking about capsular rupture. Does it alter oncological outcome? You know, there was a study in 2008 that there was no known recurrence of clinical signs, you know, and I think it's pretty rare for that happen to that to happen as to what happened, you know, in the case that I just described. Uh, so, you know, something to think about as, uh, you know, you choose your cases for laparoscopy. So this was, um, you know, I'll probably end the talk on, on this slide. This is a, a case that, uh, you know, another left-sided uh, uh, tumor. Uh, this is the, the CT, the coronal CT, pretty close to that, just the start or the, sorry, the insertion of the renal vein onto the vena cava. And the case started out pretty routinely. You know, we started dissecting in between the kidney and the adrenal gland. And, you know, right now we're just, we're trying to get into a plane in between. This is the phrenico-abdominal vein and the renal vein is going to be somewhere in here. And just trying to get into that plane we were having a tough time doing it and, uh, you know, very kind of surprised about that. But this is what I was talking about, these fibrous planes. Sometimes you're just not able to, to get into there safely without putting your, you know, your hands in there at the time of open surgery. So we persisted for a little bit. Uh, we, you know, we, we kept getting this nuisance hemorrhage. You know, it wasn't major hemorrhage, but certainly enough of a nuisance that we couldn't put in additional instrumentation. We continually had to put in our suction tip. Just ended up being a challenging case for visualization, and we ended up converting to open surgery. And, you know, I don't think there's any, no shame at all in open surgery. At the end of the day, we need to do what's best for our patients and the safest thing at the time. And, uh, you know, I think ultimately, end of the day, if you have any concerns with hemorrhage, if you are unable to visualize those planes that you need to get in to identify whether it's the phrenico abdominal vein, the vena cava, the renal vein, I mean, I think readily converting is, uh, you know, the smart choice in those situations. So with that, you know, I'm just going to uh, flip to my question slide. I, I really appreciate, uh, you know, Dr. Tweed, Dr. Chamness, TMI for having me and, um, you know, very happy to take any other questions. Hey, thanks a lot, Amit. Um, I guess I'll ask one quick question since I'm an internal medicine person. Is there any place for laparoscopic adren bilateral adrenalectomies and hyperadrenocorticism cases, and then going on treating them as adensodians after that? Yeah, I, you know, I'm so happy that you asked that question, Dave. I mean, I would love to go down that that route, you know, because I think obviously that the laparoscopy for those cases, you know, I think it would be, you know, on the the sort of the technically less demanding side of the spectrum. You know, the question is, I have had that discussion with our internal medicine group and, and our, our, our medicine group is fantastic. You know, they're, you know, they're interested in doing something like that. I guess the question is, is that, you know, would owners be willing to do that? Would they want to treat for, uh, you know, hypoadrenocorticism versus, you know, trilostane seems to be something that's working well, um, costs of, of either the bilateral lapadrenal versus, you know, the, the medication. I don't know. You tell me, what do you think? Well, I think maybe some that uh, you really have a hard time controlling, uh, that might be a consideration. That's my yeah, thought. Yeah, I think that'd be really, yeah, really interesting area to investigate, I think, for sure. Uh, there's one quick question, maybe then we'll finish up. Uh, have you used ultrasonic dissection, the harmonic uh, type? Um, uh, this person said they've had good results using that, uh, maybe less scary around uh, vessels. Yeah, that's a really great point. I personally have not. I know surgeons that, that have, and I, I totally agree. I think that'd be a, a really nice instrumentation or vessel sealing choice, I guess ultrasonic choice. Uh, in, in those, some of those tight planes. So totally agree. And, and congratulations on your success with that. 
Okay, with that, um, I think, uh, well, thank you very much for uh, presenting today. It was a fantastic uh, webinar. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Um, in two weeks, we'll learn about transcervical insemination presented by two reproduction experts from Colorado State University, uh, Dr. Hollinshead and Dr. Burns. That session will take place Wednesday, May 5th at 8 p.m. New York time. And we look forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, wishing you all the best of health.